When it comes down to it, there's jutsus in Naruto that people understand, and there's jutsus that people don't. Naruto's power system, by and large, is not a complicated one. There's elemental releases. You either use the earth, you use fire, you use air, you use lightning, or you use water. However, a couple of complicated elements did get introduced over time. Things like yin release and yang release. Things like genjutsu and different dojutsus that all operate differently. Sage mode, the eight gates, Naruto's power system was always much more than just the elements. Elements. And while these individual pieces aren't all that complicated, when you begin to tie them into each other and build an entire fleshed out universe wide power system that is composed of all of these individual pieces, people can get a little bit lost. However, when it really comes down to it, there is one piece that throws people to this day. And that one piece is not at Laugh Tale, that one piece is Space Time Ninjutsu. You see, because Space Time Ninjutsu is murky. At least the explanation on how it works is murky. It seems as though multiple different things that operate in very different ways are all labeled as space-time ninjutsu, and therefore understanding what is space-time ninjutsu, and more importantly, why is it space-time ninjutsu, are questions that perplex a lot of Naruto fans. And while the concept of space-time ninjutsu has never been all that complicated to me, that's because understanding these kinds of things is my job. However, that doesn't mean it is a concept doesn't trip me up sometimes. And what I've realized, especially after researching today's video, is that the reason that Space Time Ninjutsu and Naruto never confused me is because I didn't know enough. See, when I say the word mitochondria, you can go, oh, it's the powerhouse of the cell. Now, boom, you and me both appear to understand how the mitochondria works. But the second you start to actually dive into how a mitochondria functions within the greater scheme of a cell, the concept of the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell might get a bit more complicated. And for as long as I've run this Naruto page, that's the relationship I've had with Space Time Ninjutsu. Because for the entirety of NC Hammer 23's run, Space Time Ninjutsu, to me at least, has just been the way to connect two separate places, either in the same dimension or in different dimensions. And while that still holds true, boy oh boy is there more to it. But why am I doing this deep dive into Space Time Ninjutsu now? Well, mostly because Space Time Ninjutsu within the confines of Boruto was getting more important by the chapter. Whether it be the Space Time Ninjutsu of the Otsutsuki, the Karma Marking the Jogun, or Flying Thunder God, the ability to either travel incredibly quickly in your own dimension or between different dimensions using Space Time Ninjutsu is probably the most important it's ever been. But still, that's hardly an explanation as to why I had to do a deep dive on something that I thought I had an understanding of for years. And there Therefore, the real reason that I'm looking at space-time ninjutsu under the world's most powerful microscope is because there's something that happens in Chapter 4 of Boruto's Two Blue Vortex that made me start to reconsider everything I know about space-time ninjutsu. See, in this most recent chapter of Boruto to Blue Vortex, we saw Boruto captured by the Shinju, or the Divine Trees. And upon being captured by, presumably, Moegi, Boruto was put in a situation supposedly where the Shinju would have had a pretty easy time fighting him and turning him into an actual Divine Tree. However, because the Shinju were currently on a quest to fill their ego and gain as much information as possible, they were rallying against the Primal Instincts to bite Boruto and turn him into a Divine Tree. And while in the moment, as I was reading this chapter, all of this made sense to me. I was emailed a couple of days later by somebody apparently with better reading skills than me or just a more adapted brain who said to me, well, would it really have been all that big a deal if Boruto was bitten by the Shinju? Because after all, Boruto and the Shinju were in the Kara dimension. And since the Kara dimension exists in a different dimension than Earth's dimension, a divine tree grown in the Kara dimension wouldn't affect Earth. And honestly, I occasionally get the email that throws me off my kilter a little bit. This one genuinely rocked me because so far as I understood, Yes, they were absolutely right. A divine tree in the Kara dimension wouldn't affect Earth, and therefore it's a possibility that the Shinju weren't even just acting against their urges, they were using their actual brain to identify that wasting Boruto in the Kara dimension would be idiotic. However, when Boruto returns from his battle against the Shinju to Kashin Koji, Kashin Koji makes it very clear that if Boruto was eaten and turned into a divine tree, it would have signaled the end of the world, which opens the door to the possibility that a divine tree grown in Kara's dimension would affect Earth's. And so far as I understand space-time as it pertains to the Naruto universe, that doesn't make sense. But it's either a plot hole, me misunderstanding how space-time ninjutsu works in Naruto, or a possible massive reveal to where Boruto and Kashin Koji's hideout 
actually is. And as non-consequential as those three things may sound, they're actually all incredibly important, one, to our understanding of the Naruto universe, which for some reason is important to me, and two, to the possible future of Boruto. As the wording of Kashin Koji when Boruto returns to him after the battle against the Shinju is slightly ambiguous. And that ambiguity might actually lead to the discovery of an entirely separate planet. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we got a whole lot to talk about. Genuinely, it probably should be two videos, but we're doing it in one. Because when it comes down to that space-time continuum mumbo jumbo, I love talking about it, especially as it pertains to the Boruto universe. So sit back and relax, because today we're talking everything you knew about Boruto's universe. Is wrong. But before we get into a high level theoretical physics class about a fictional universe, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like learning about things in the world through the lens of anime, you're gonna love my other channel, The Weeb Commander, because I rant over there as well. But instead of ranting about Naruto and Boruto, I rant about all other anime. Or if you like losing brain cells, then you're gonna love my anime podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. However, if you simply wanna look like somebody who learns about things through the medium of anime, then you should meander on over into my merch store, Takuzanonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. So, space-time ninjutsu. Many would say that it was the introduction of Kaguya that truly brought about space-time ninjutsu as we understand it in the Naruto universe, as it was Kaguya's introduction that truly sent us down the spiral into multiverse madness. And this is a somewhat fair, though slightly inaccurate take, as Kaguya is still to this day one of the most proficient and high-level space-time ninjutsu users we've ever seen. In fact, when it comes down to it, if you were to say who is the greatest space-time ninjutsu user of all time, it's either Kaguya or Hagoromo. Yes, she's inarguably better at space-time ninjutsu than Ishiki or Momo. However, Naruto has been dealing with space-time ninjutsu in different dimensions since long before Kaguya's introduction. I mean, sure, obviously Kaguya's Omino Manaka was the most impressive space-time ninjutsu feat we've ever seen from anybody. As with Omino Manaka, she was able to tear parts of other dimensions away from their dimensions and pull them directly to her location, something that we didn't even know was possible up until we saw it used. As every other instance of space-time ninjutsu prior to Omino Manaka brought things from other dimensions to the current dimension of the person summoning it. However, Kaguya had the the ability to pull physical dimensions to her dimension and replace the dimension around her with a separate dimension. And that is objectively insane. However, the first time that we saw space-time ninjutsu used in Naruto was long before Kaguya. Specifically, the first time that we ever saw it used is in the Land of Waves arc. Yes, that's right, because the first time that space-time ninjutsu is ever used on screen or in manga in Naruto is when Kakashi summons his Ninken. Specifically, when Kakashi summons his Ninken to follow Zabuza's blood trail. And while many people wouldn't consider summoning jutsus as a space-time ninjutsu, by the letter of the law, they are, as they're able to warp a summoned object or being from one part of the dimension to another. And the way that summoning jutsu accomplishes this feat is by sending said summoned object or being into a dimensional void and then having them travel in that dimensional void from the location where they were summoned from to the location where they're being summoned to. And while this usually happens in the same dimension, in fact, pretty much 99.999% of all summoning jutsu happens in the same dimension, it became clear to us in the fourth great shinobi world war that this works across dimensions, as Sasuke, after being cast into Kaguya's lava dimension, was able to summon Garuda, his hawk summon, who very much exists in Earth's dimension. And this kind of makes sense, because in order for a summoning jutsu to work in the first place, the summoned object or being has to enter a dimensional void, a space between between dimensions so that they can travel instantaneously. And this is why summoning jutsus happen instantaneously, because there is technically no distance between the place that they're summoned and the place that they were summoned from, as a dimensional void has no distance or matter. Because of this, technically, even when you summon something from the same dimension as you, it is interdimensional travel. And this is actually why I speculated that Flying Thunder God would allow Minato to escape things like the Kamui dimension, as the ability is already reliant on Minato leaving whatever dimension he's currently in. And obviously, with Chapter 4 of Two Blue Vortex, I was proven right. But if space-time ninjutsu has always been such a big part of Naruto, why do we know so little about it? Or is it possible that we actually know more than we think we do? Well, this is the problem that I was posed with when I found myself pondering as to why Kashin Koji would be nervous about Boruto being turned into a divine tree in Kara's dimension. Because if, genuinely, Kashin Koji believed that Boruto turning into a divine tree in Kara's dimension would affect Earth, does that mean that all of the dimensions in the Naruto universe exist on top of each other? Does it mean we're able to affect what happens in other dimensions 
things in other dimensions? Or does it simply just mean that Kashin Koji believes that the plan that they had formulated over the course of two years would be doomed without Boruto? Essentially, does Kashin Koji believe that Boruto's death in any capacity would lead to the end of the world? Well, in order to answer those questions, I realized I have to understand space-time ninjutsu better. And by I have to understand space-time ninjutsu better, I mean I have to draw conclusions. See, I know everything there is to know about space-time ninjutsu, but just knowing what space-time ninjutsu is and how it works doesn't mean I fully understand it. See, I have to take the knowledge that I have about space-time ninjutsu and realize what that knowledge means. Sure, I can say that Amano Minaka allows Kaguya to tear parts of other dimensions and pull them to her current location, but what does that mean for the greater space-time fabric in the Boruto universe. These are the kind of conclusions that we need to be able to draw. Thus, we need to break down and understand everything possible about space-time ninjutsu in order to understand why Kashin Koji was concerned. And thus, once we fully understand the space-time fabric of the Boruto and Naruto universe, we can understand if Kashin Koji was just worried about Boruto's health or worried if a divine tree built in the Kara's dimension would affect Earth. So where do you start when you're trying to teach a theoretical physics class on a fictional universe? at the beginning. And there's really nothing more at the beginning when talking about dimensional travel and dimensional abilities in Boruto and Naruto than addressing the dimensions that we know exist. And there are a lot of dimensions. See, as it currently exists, and I'm gonna read off the list because I don't have them all memorized, surprise, surprise, we have Nui's dimension, currently referred to as the Underworld, the Drunken Dream dimension, the Daikokuten, Kaguya's dimensions, Kamui dimension, Kara's dimension, the Pure Lands, and possibly wherever the Shikigami lives. The Shikigami that you're able to summon using Reaper Death Seal, that is. As we have to assume that an actual God of Death probably lives in some form of Underworld. And there's also Limbo, where Kakashi's dad lives. Or or lived. I think he's gone now. So all in all, there is over 10 dimensions in the Boruto universe, though a lot of them are only ever referenced one to two times. But for pretty much the entirety of both Naruto and Boruto, the concept of a multiverse has been right there with us. And while the majority of space-time ninjutsu, as it pertains to humans, revolves around traveling quickly in your own dimension, the first ever space-time ninjutsu, the progenitor of all space-time ninjutsu, was Yamutsu Hirasaka. Now, Yamutsu Hirasaka, for those of you who don't remember the Japanese names of every jutsu in Naruto, congratulations, you're happy, is the ability that Kaguya uses that opens kind of like a black window, and Kaguya either retreats into said black window or appears from one, and Sasuke's able to track where they're going to open using a six to my Rinnegan. That's Yamutsu Hirasaka, and it is the first ever space-time ninjutsu ever created. And in fact, Yumutsu Hirasaka was the first jutsu ever used on Earth. As after Kaguya eats the chakra fruit, she uses Yumutsu Hirasaka to open a dimensional portal to a moon in a separate dimension. She then reflects her Rinnie Sharingan off said moon and is able to cast the world into Infinite Tsukiyomi. Because the biggest issue with using Infinite Tsukiyomi on Earth was the fact that prior to Kaguya being sealed, there was no moon. So before Infinite Tsukiyomi could even be used on Earth, Yumutsu Hirasaka had to be used to bring Earth up moon. Technically, that is from a filler episode, but it does answer a fantastic question in a very concise and clear way. And if filler answers questions that the manga doesn't answer, that's canon to me. Now, Yumutsu Hirasaka in Japanese actually refers to the downward slope that leads you to the underworld. However, in the Naruto universe, it's a technique that the Otsutsuki use to travel either in the same dimension or between separate dimensions, which is why the Otsutsuki are technically terrorists in all dimensions, as they just as easily can travel in the same dimension using this technique and pop into a separate dimension and eradicated of life. And we know that thousands of planets hold life outside of Earth in the Naruto universe, as Momoshiki is shown to have converted at least a dozen planets into chakra fruits. And in the novelization of Boruto's movie, when we're first introduced to Momoshiki, he's standing over the ruins of a fairly complicated and advanced society that he just crumbled to ash by turning it into a chakra fruit. Though Momoshiki does say that the society pales in comparison to the chakra fruit that Earth would create, he, we know that Shibai was able to turn so many planets into chakra fruits that he was able to abandon in his body. And the reason that the Otsutsuki are able to find this many populated planets is because they can travel to all dimensions in existence. Which is actually why it took the likes of Momoshiki and Kinshiki so long to find Kaguya's planet, as they had to follow the curvature of space-time to try and identify what planet was augmented by Otsutsuki presence. And it wasn't until they identified that the planet that Kaguya had gone to hadn't undergone chakra fruit Ification, but they realized they needed to go check in on Kaguya. But Yumutsu Hirasaka works through the wormhole theory, which can be best explained with a piece of paper. Now, if I were to tell you what's the fastest way from one of these dots to the other dot, you would probably say, well, in a straight line, right? No turns, no squiggles, just the straight line between these two dots. And technically, you would be correct. However, space-time isn't flat. It's not 
2D. And therefore, technically, while traveling through space-time, we don't have to apply to the laws of 2D physics. So in actuality, the fastest way between these two spots, assuming that there was a wormhole, wouldn't actually be this straight line. But instead, if we folded this piece of paper and then drove a pen or a pencil through this piece of paper. Now, by using a wormhole or by using Yamutsu Hirasaka, these two points are technically right next to each other, but we need our pen. And this is how Yumutsu Hirasaka works, by connecting two places in space, whether they be in the same dimension or separate dimensions, and getting the quickest way there. But human space-time ninjutsu, by and large, works in a straight line. Let's say I use Flying Raijin to teleport myself 100 kilometers north. Technically, I would cast myself down into a dimensional void, and then my body would travel in said dimensional void to the new marking. However, since there is no matter and no space in the dimensional void, technically, it kind of is like a wormhole. As all possible markings that I could have on the ground or anywhere with Flying Thunder God are connected through the medium of no space being in between them but i'm not connecting these two points these two points just have no space between them and this is actually kind of important to know because so far as we understand accessing human space-time ninjutsu things like summoning jutsu or flying thunder god which is basically just summoning jutsu for yourself is the best way to nullify all dimensionally bound abilities now what do i mean by dimensionally bound abilities well these are abilities that only have effect within the dimension that they're cast well nick wouldn't that be almost all of the abilities in Naruto? Yeah, kind of. Best example of space-time ninjutsu being able to nullify dimensionally bound abilities in Naruto is Minato in the Fourth Great Shinobi World War. See, in the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, four Kage decide to make a four-sided barrier around the Ten Tails, as the Ten Tails is powering up a tailed beast bomb that they're afraid will wipe out the majority of the Shinobi Alliance. However, these four Kage understand that the power of their barrier will not break at the hands of said tailed beast bomb. Only problem is there's a bunch of people inside said barrier with the Ten Tails. So if that tailed beast bomb goes off inside of the barrier and the barrier is break everybody inside of the barrier is dead so it's at this point that minato decides to use flying thunder god to literally get every single person inside the barrier outside the barrier one of the most if not the most impressive speed feat in all of naruto point blank period except for maybe naruto dodging a photon laser while riding a bike in naruto retsudan but this one was animated but how is minato able to teleport outside of a barrier well it's simple the barrier doesn't affect the dimensional void so so long as you are not currently in the dimension where that barrier is that barrier does not affect you you. And thus, when Minato accesses the dimensional void under Naruto's dimension, he's able to escape things like any kind of ceiling jutsu, as those ceiling jutsus only affect him when he's in that dimension. This is why in Hiroshima's battle against Orochimaru, if he had reverse summoned to Enma, he could have just escaped the battle. And this is why basically any kind of space-time ninjutsu makes ceiling jutsus all but irrelevant. So long as you can travel in your own dimension instantaneously or between dimensions, there's pretty much no way to seal you, outside of things like Six Patch Shibaku Tensei, obviously. Now that is also important to know, because it shows us that jutsus don't have the ability to break between dimensions which can be evidence of the fact that either your average person in Naruto isn't able to use multi-dimensional attacks, or that the dimensions in Naruto are too far apart to use multi-dimensional attacks. And honestly, knowing what I now know about space-time ninjutsu, the latter seems more likely. See, we're fully aware that the majority of space-time ninjutsu allow you to either access your own dimension or access your own little pocket dimension. And by own dimension, I mean the dimension that you're currently in, and by pocket dimension, I mean things like the Kamui dimension or the Daikoku Ten. And if, let's say, hypothetically, you do have a space-time ninjutsu, that gives you something like a pocket dimension, we know that users are able to access this dimension rather easily, as Obito with his level of chakra was able to access the Kamui dimension almost endlessly. Kawaki and Ishiki both have next to no problem accessing the Daikoku Ten as often as necessary, and people like Minato and Tenten who use summoning techniques hundreds if not thousands of times a day when they're fighting are able to use those summoning techniques over and over and over again. So whether or not the user of space-time ninjutsu is using a space-time ninjutsu that allows them to summon objects from their own dimension or teleport themselves to other places in their own dimension, or if they're teleporting objects, other people, parts of themselves, or their entire selves into their own pocket dimensions, we know that chakra expenditure-wise, it's not all that difficult. However, at the end of the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, when Obito was trying to synchronize his Kamui with Kaguya's space-time ninjutsu to follow her into her separate dimension, we saw that Obito, even with both of his Kamui eyes, 
didn't have enough chakra to follow her to said dimension. And the biggest reason that Obito wasn't able to follow her to said dimension is because of the distance between the dimension that they were currently in and the dimension that Kaguya was in. In fact, Obito states that the further the dimension is away, the more chakra it would cost to synchronize and get there. Which is to say, in simpler terms, that the amount of chakra required to synchronize with somebody else's space-time ninjutsu is proportional to the distance that dimension is away from the one that you're in. But the most important thing in any of that is that there's distance distance between these dimensions and that distance can change. That is to say, if you were to say this screen is the entirety of the universe, there could be dimensions down here and dimensions up there. And the furthest you could possibly travel would be from dimensions down here to dimensions up there. But there could be a dimension right here and a dimension right here. And this travel right here would cost you less chakra than this travel right here. Boy oh boy could I not be a weatherman. But this is important to know because this means the dimensions in the Naruto universe kind of act like galaxies in our universe. Thus while there is galaxies in universes within Naruto's dimension, if you were to break out of that dimension you would end up in the dimensional void until you were able to travel to another dimension. And thus much in the same way that galaxies exist in a universe, the dimensions exist in some kind of greater universe. And this makes sense because in order for the be things like dimensional voids, there has to be places where dimension does not exist. So instead of every single dimension existing on top of each other, which is how people speculate that our multiverse exists, as we're able to observe electrons hopping between what we believe are separate dimensions, the dimensions in Naruto and Boruto operate more like different continents, but instead of ocean between them, there's massive dimensional voids. And this theory of how the dimensions of the Naruto and Boruto universe exist is corroborated by Kaguya's use of Omino Manaka. As when Kaguya uses Omino Manaka, once again, she's able to take parts of other dimensions and pull them to her current location. Now, one would assume when you explain how this technique works is that Kaguya would just kind of change the landscape. And she does do that. And that is kind of how Amano Manaka works. But on top of just changing the dimension, Amano Manaka also takes everybody within the confines of Amano Manaka to a separate dimension. So let's say hypothetically in my office, I had a hundred people for some reason. And I used Amano Manaka, but the range of my Amano Manaka was only three feet in a radius around me. That would mean that 25 or 30 of you would come to whatever dimension I just pulled to me, while the other 70 or so of you would just see us disappear. And this is exactly what happens in the fourth grade Shinobi World War. Team 7 and Obito just disappear from the battlefield when Kaguya decides to use his ability, which means that those within the range of Omino Manaka are brought to a separate dimension, while those outside of the range just see those people disappear, which shows us a couple of things. One, you cannot exist in two dimensions simultaneously. As if you could exist in two dimensions simultaneously, we would still be seeing all of the people affected by Omino Manaka. And two, and maybe more importantly than the first thing, two dimensions cannot exist in the exact same place simultaneously. Because when Kage used Omino Manaka for the first time and brought Team 7 and Obito to the Lava Dimension, the rest of the Shinobi Alliance didn't see the Lava Dimension. But Kaguya, when she uses this ability, brings dimensions to herself. Which means, technically, Kaguya did bring the Lava Dimension to the battlefield of the Shinobi Alliance. But since nobody outside of those affected by Omino Manaka can see the Lava Dimension, this means that the Lava Dimension has now become enveloped in the space-time of... Earth's dimension. But this doesn't mean it operates like a big old bubble. That if you were to walk into where Team 7 and Kaguya were a second ago, that you would be teleported into the lava dimension. No, because if it worked that way, Team 7, after they defeated Kaguya, would have been able to simply walk outside of the bounds of said dimension. Instead, what Kaguya is doing is taking pieces of dimensions from far away, which proves these dimensions actually operate like physical entities, capable of being split, separated, and moved, and bringing those physical dimensions to her location. So if you think about Earth's dimension, like a tight sheet, and Kaguya Kaguya is right here as she uses Omino Manaka. Once she pulls another part of a dimension to her current location, Earth space time would bend around it because now there's a big old bubble of separate dimension on top of that tight sheet. And this is actually how space time works. It's able to be bent by objects of super mass. And since it appears as though in the Naruto and Boruto universe, dimensions are more of a physical entity, by Kaguya pulling parts of dimensions to her current location, she will be bending the space time of the dimension she's currently in. And we understand fully that space time 
time can be bent in the Naruto universe because Mike Guy does it with the eighth gate. Just because now that dimension exists like a ball on top of the super tight sheet that is Earth space time does not mean that you can just waltz right into it. It simply makes the multiverse theory of Naruto slightly closer to what we have here on Earth, as these two space times are now co-inhabiting space. And this is further corroborated by the fact that after Kaguya is defeated, but Naruto and Sasuke use a six past Shibako Tensei on her and she dies, and yes, she does die, it was confirmed in the fourth data book, these dimensional rifts to separate locations don't disappear, which means that Kaguya, through the ability of her Amanomanaka, is able to make permanent, lasting changes to the greater multiverse. Which is why, even though Team 7 technically never leaves the Shinobi Alliance battlefields, they still need to be summoned back by Hagoromo, gathering all of the Gokage to bring their chakra together to bring Team 7 back to Earth's dimension. As every single time that Kagi uses Omanomanaka, it's kind of like adding a page. Now, what I mean by that is that one could argue that both my middle finger and my thumb, when placed like this, are in the same location. However, between my middle finger and my thumb are the separate different dimensions that Kaguya kept summoning with Omanomanaka. So while my physical location in space-time hasn't changed, the dimension in which I'm inhabiting has. But this is actually really important for us to note, because now that all of these dimensions that Kaguya forcibly ripped from all of the corners of the multiverse are now on top of Earth's space-time, they are as physically close to Earth's dimension as they possibly could be. Which means if ever there was going to be an opportunity for these other dimensions to affect Earth's dimension, now would be the time. However, nothing that happens in any of these other dimensions throughout Team 7's battle against Kaguya affects Earth. Not any of Kaguya's gravity attacks, and since gravity is quite literally what bends space-time, according to Einstein, he was a pretty smart guy. If anything was going to affect two dimensions existing on top of each other, it should have been Kaguya's gravity attacks. But more than that, Kaguya is sealed in a brand new moon in her own dimension, and that new moon doesn't affect any of Naruto's universe's tides or anything like that, which kind of proves to us that what happens in separate dimensions stays in separate dimensions, even when they're as physically close to each other as possible. Now, some people would argue that we've already seen evidence of things in separate dimensions affecting Naruto's dimension. People would say that that one instance is Limbo clones. But Limbo is not a separate dimension. See, Limbo is actually an invisible world that coexists with Earth, but the entirety of this world is usually impossible to either see or perceive. And Limbo is less like a multiverse and more like ghosts. That is to say that if you believed in ghosts, you would say that they have the ability to knock things over and open and close doors. But usually ghosts are invisible or imperceivable. Imperceptible. Imperceptible. And thus Madara isn't casting his limbo clones into another dimension. He's casting his limbo clones into a world that coexists with Earth. Because if he was casting his clones into another dimension, they wouldn't be able to hit Naruto or Sasuke. And I actually believe that limbo border jail being explained like this actually proves the point that you can't affect other dimensions dimensions from the dimension you're in in Naruto. I mean, otherwise, why would the Otsutsuki need the ability to travel between dimensions? If they could simply affect what was happening in Naruto's dimension from a separate dimension, that would be way more useful for them. So now that we know this, it's relatively easy to come to the conclusion that a divine tree grown in the Kara dimension would not affect Earth. And really, the only possible arguments you could make for a divine tree growing in the Kara dimension having an effect on Earth would be if somehow the roots of the divine tree were able to travel between the dimensional portals that they have in the Kara dimension that allowed Kara to easily access Earth. And thus, these roots of the Divine Tree traveling through these portals would allow these roots to reach Earth. But considering the fact that Code destroyed all of these portals after Ishiki's death so that humans couldn't easily access Kara's dimension, I don't really see that happening anytime soon. Now, hypothetically, there's also the chance that Code would be able to take these roots through his claw marks, but that just feels silly. So I have to assume one of two other possible answers. The first of which is that Kashin Koji believes that if Boruto were to die in any capacity, that be as a divine tree or just at the hands of a random kunai, that the evil guys would win. And since the evil guys want to destroy the world, that would mean that Boruto's death equals the end of the world. That's a definite possibility. Second possibility stems from the fact that when Kashin Koji is berating Boruto as he returns, he berates him in a weirdly ambiguous way. See, when Boruto returns from the card dimension, we don't necessarily know as to whether whether or not he goes back to Earth's dimension, or even Earth. Because when Boruto returns to Sasuke's tree, Kashin Koji says, do you want to destroy this planet? Not Earth, not Konoha, not the world. He says, this planet. Which leads me to the possible, though somewhat unlikely conclusion, that Kashin Koji and Boruto and Sasuke's tree 
are not on Earth, and instead their hideout exists actually in the same dimension as Kara's hideout. Because we have to ask the somewhat logical question here, why did Kara choose the dimension that they're currently in? And where did all the people that work at Kara's hideout come from? Did they come from Earth brought through the gates to work in Kara's other dimensional hideout? Or were they citizens of the planet that Kara decided to inhabit. And thus, when Boruto returns to Kush and Koji, he's not yelling at him over the possibility of him destroying Earth. He's yelling at him over the possibility of destroying an entirely separate planet, one that may or may not be populated. And thus, a divine tree grown in this dimension would lead to an equal amount of casualties as if it were to grow on Earth. Or everything we know about space time ninjutsu is either wrong, is going to be retconned, or and Kishimoto forgot. Based off everything you've learned today about Naruto's grander multiverse, what do you think would happen if a divine tree were to grow in Kara's dimension? Do you believe it would affect Earth? Do you believe that it should affect Earth? Tell me in the comments below. And to why it goes down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. The possibility that I just taught an entire theoretical physics course on a fake multiverse that's about to be retconned is high. <laughs>